If you're applying to medicine in the UK, you're probably wondering what an online interview is actually like. Although there are lots of resources and they can tell you what subjects are going to come up, there's nothing out there that's going to show you from your perspective what you're going to experience when you go through your online medicine interview. Until now, I've managed to get permission to share with you a real interview and from the point of view of the interviewee, what it's going to feel like, the kind of thing that's going to happen and what happens when you do an online interview, exactly the progression and how it feels, how it happens so that you can prepare and know exactly what's coming. If you want some help and have an interview like this simulated, reach out to us because we're doing an interview crash course to get people ready. But for now, you can watch this video where you can see exactly what an interview is like, enjoy, try and learn from it as much as possible and hopefully it can help prepare you for your real interview on the day. So you're going to see everything as the interviewee sees it. So the questions as they pop up, the stations as they rotate through them, the different panels as they move through those. But otherwise, I hope you find this useful. Let's see if from going through the video, you can guess which university this interview belongs to. But otherwise, enjoy and I will see you at the end. Hi, my name is Peter and I'm the other assessor. Hi, uh, I'm Anna. Nice to meet you. Nice um, to meet if you see us first, like looking down at any point, it's because we're just taking notes. Yeah, um, that's fine. Okay, so your first question is, can you tell us about a time when you've disagreed with someone at home, school or work? So what happened and how was it resolved? Um, uh, I guess I have a pretty good example for this. Um, I have a pretty close personal friend. We've been friends for a few years now. I think probably six, seven, eight years. Um, and he was quite strongly against taking the COVID vaccinations. Um, and it was just the COVID vaccination specifically. He's not anti-vax, he's had his uh, shots when he was younger. But um, what when this came up, well, obviously it had been coming up quite a lot throughout COVID. You know, we're saying you need to get your vac vaccines, there's people falling ill, you might fall ill, we're concerned for you. And throughout, literally the last whole two years he's just been saying no i'm not getting vaccinated i'm not doing it and from from my understanding now it's just because he's against pfizer and these big pharmaceutical companies he has some kind of uh predisposition against feeding into these mega pharmaceutical companies and obviously me being the medical friend in the group i've i've tried to speak to him separately like out away from everyone else like you know this is this is going to be good for your health i understand that you might have these uh, you might have these problems with these companies, but at the end of the day, it's it's for your own good. And, you know, it's not like you don't interact with these sort of companies in another scenario. For example, he uses Instagram. And in my opinion, that could be just as harmful or more harmful than feeding it to Pfizer, honestly. And, you know, well, we, we did have a big conversation about this and we did go back and forth. But uh, at the end of the day, I recognized that he was just so stead, like he was so stuck in his view. I, there wasn't really anything I could say to him that would be able to convince him otherwise. And unfortunately, he, he still hasn't got his vaccine. And as a result, he didn't manage to go on a trip with uh, the rest of the group to Europe. So he was left out during that. And yeah, that was quite unfortunate uh, that I haven't been able to convince him. But I recognized that if I kept pushing and trying to get him to do this, honestly like we've been going on for two years it's not going to change anything and i didn't want to keep patronizing him because clearly he wasn't going to change his mind which is quite unfortunate honestly yeah. okay. thank you and obviously from this example you kind of said that unfortunately it didn't work out um but why do you think it's kind of important for doctors to need to be able to be good at working with other people yeah well i think um it's important to be able to work with difficult patients just because at the end of the day, as, as doctors, we're trying to work in their best interest. And sometimes they may be difficult simply because they don't understand the situation. So it's important to make sure that the patient that you're speaking to fully understands, you know, what's going on with them, what uh, options they have available and what's happened so far so that they fully understand the situation. And um, then, that then they might be able to uh, come to see what, what you're saying as the doctor, what recommendations you're making. They might be able to understand it a bit better. Um, and it, as, as the doctor, you're just there to be the caregiver. You're not, you're not there to um, you know, change ideologies. You're, you're just there to help improve the health of a patient. So obviously if they're, if they're very 
um, strongly against an idea, for example, just because of religious background or some kind of something that's happened in their past. Um, I think it's it's good to be able to deal with that without um, becoming uh, without bringing uh, um, sorry without angering the patient. I think it's important to be able to explain this, like, explain your viewpoint pr correctly and in a way that they can understand, so that they can potentially um, bring down the level. Because if they if they understand the situation, if they understand you're there to help them, then they're less likely to be difficult. Thank you. And my last question is, can a doctor ever have too much empathy and respect for a patient's views? Too much empathy and respect for a patient's views? Um, I think definitely too much respect for a patient's views. I can see that happening. Um, for example, if, if it's something relatively minor, um, like, oh, I'm, I'm scared of needles. I don't want to get this injection. And then the doctor's like, oh, okay, you don't want, you don't want it. Okay, we won't do it. I think that's 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 a bit too far. Um, in that case, it's kind of unreasonable. Where, like, if if you haven't asked to see, you know, why why are you scared of these needles? Why do you not want it? If you just sign, if if you just straight away um, conform to whatever the patient wants without finding out why or finding out what the reasons are, then it can be harmful because at the end of the day, you know, potentially this injection could have been very helpful for. I don't know, finding out some some more details about the condition that they have or um, something else along those lines. Um, and in terms of too much empathy, um, that's a difficult question, honestly. I think I think it can become a problem at some point. Um, obviously, if you're... Hi, sorry, I'm going to have to cut you. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's fine. Sorry. For the next question, um, it's a hypothetical scenario, so I'm going to read out to you first. Okay, great. One of the junior doctors on a hospital ward. The day after um, his surgery, a 70-year-old man is transferred to intensive care with a life-threatening pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot in the chest. During a routine meeting, the consultant reviewing the complication identifies that one of the junior doctors has failed to prescribe the medication required to prevent this type of blood clot. Mm. So the question is, firstly, how will you respond personally, knowing that your lack of action has had serious implications for a real person? Um, well, I think, I believe it's called duty of candor, where it's expected of a doctor to be on about their mistakes. So I think, especially if I was in this situation personally, I would, I would make sure to say to the consultant and when appropriate to the patient, look, I've made this mistake. I failed to prescribe this uh, medicine. This is this is on me. Um, so yeah, I, th I think I would go to the consultant and explain that. And I think it's important to own up in that situation because it's it's quite serious. Mm. Well, even if it wasn't serious, I think it's important to own up just for the sake of clarity. Mm -hmm. You partly answered this, but just in case you had anything else to add to it, why do you think it's important for doctors to play this duty of candor so owning up to their mistakes yeah i think it's important in i think two main ways so one being uh transparency to the patient and the public it ensures help uh, or it helps ensure that the patients trust the doctors because if they're if they've made a mistake and they're trying to cover it up or they're not making it obvious or they're just not telling you as a patient um then they're going to they're going to lose trust because obviously you've gone and made a mistake and then you're not telling them they're just next time they might not even come to the doctors because they they've they've had bad experiences in the past now they won't trust the doctors because they think oh they're just going to lie to me or they're just not going to help me because they have made a mistake last time um and it's also important in terms of um i think your own self-improvement as well you need to be honest that with that mistake and um, being able to be honest with that will help you improve in the future because then people can help correct you with that. Um, and I guess as well, it would be important for the sake of the patient and that specific scenario and the care that you're going to deliver to that patient because uh, if you've made a mistake, for example, um, I guess it's not exactly the scenario, but if you've given the wrong prescription rather than not a prescription at all, then it might have different side effects and different interactions with some sort of other care that you might have to provide to the patient. Um, so yeah, I think there are definitely multiple reasons that you should have to be uh, as clear as you can with any mistakes that you make. Okay, thank you. 
The next question is, how would you inform your fellow staff members? Um, so following on about the scenario that I read at the start. Okay, so I think, um, as I said, I would probably go first to the consultant just because he's the one that highlighted the problem in the first place. Um, and yeah, after I've spoken to him, unless he's already made this disclosure that I've made the mistake, I think um, maybe, I'm not sure if this would be the most appropriate place as obviously I haven't been in the scenario myself, but potentially at the next MDT meeting, because then everyone that's concerned with that patient's care is going to be present. And then you can you can be completely honest with everyone. Look, I've made this mistake. This is what's happened uh, as a result of my mistake. Um, and then everyone everyone who's concerned will be uh, enlightened as to the situation. And then we can move forward there with dealing with the problem and everyone can work together as the MDT to be able to provide the best care considering the situation that's happened. Okay, thank you. And have you ever made any mistakes that have impacted other people? And how did you overcome this? Yeah, so I I made I made a, a mistake back in it was during my A levels. So I, uh, as I would often read ahead in class, um, I would be quite well informed as to the subjects that we're covering, and especially during tests, that would help me out quite a lot. And as a result, my friends that I had in the subjects, they would come to me for help with revision, or if they found something particularly difficult, they'd say, hey, can you can you explain this to me, or can you help me with this question? So um, what ended up happening, I think this was, I believe it was to do with muscles. Uh, there was like two marks at the very end of this paper, and the teacher told us beforehand because um, we hadn't covered it in class at the time, but they still gave us the question for whatever reason. And the teacher was like, okay, go look and learn it. Go, look, go and learn it yourself. And obviously my friends came to me and said, look, this is, you've already covered this. Can you help us with this? And I said, of course, yeah. So I sat down and then I taught them through it. I, spoke, like, I explained the process. And when it came to doing the exam, I thought it was pretty all right. I got the marks at the end of the day, but then um, they came and spoke to me afterwards and said, you told us the wrong thing. We All of us got zero marks on that question. And obviously at that point, I, I felt really bad because you know I've gone and told the wrong thing. So I made sure uh, to get, get all of them together again and uh, see what the answers they put. And then I also asked the teacher, can you come and help us with this? Just because I tried to explain this and I did it wrong. So I want to make sure that I'm right this time. Uh, can you come and help us with this um, as well as that? So yeah, I got all of their answers together and made sure to see what they said. Um, I also asked the teacher for the mark scheme so I could see what the mark scheme wanted me to say. Um, and I also had the textbook and spec up at the, at the time, just so we could make sure that 100% that we've got this right for the next time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So the first question is, what are your qualities that would make me want you as my doctor? Okay. Uh, can I have just have a second to think about it? Of course. Okay, I think I'm ready to come out. Okay. Okay, so first and foremost, I think I'm quite an empathetic person. I believe that I will be able to facilitate your needs as best as I can. I'll try to understand the situation that you're in and take in, into account all of the, uh, everything about you so that I can provide the best care to, uh, to you and um, in light of all the resources and everything that we have access to in that scenario. Um, furthermore, I'm quite an academic person and I enjoy learning. I will use that to make sure that I do the best of my abilities during my time at medical school to become the best doctor that I can. And throughout my career as a doctor, I will continue to develop my skills so that I'm up to date on the best information that we have available at the time. And I will use this to make uh, educated decisions and recommendations about your care. Okay. Um, and yeah, I think I think overall I will put you at the center of everything and make sure to keep you informed about all decisions that we make about your care and make sure that you're involved throughout the entire process so that you're informed, uh, sorry, so that you're able to 
make the best decisions that you believe uh, are appropriate for you. Okay, yeah. So you've mentioned some good qualities there, like empathy. Can you describe how you demonstrate these qualities? Yeah, so um, one scenario in which I think I've demonstrated empathy is during my um, during some work experience I completed during uh, last summer. Uh, I was at a care home for a week or so, and during this time I was speaking and uh, speaking with the residents there, building relationships with them. And one resident in particular stood out to me. Um, this elderly lady, she happened to be from Bangladesh, um, and as a result, she only spoke Bengali. She didn't speak very much English. I think all the English I heard her speak during uh, my time there was uh, asking for a spoon. Um, luckily, I am also from Bangladesh, and I can also speak Bengali, so I did spend quite a lot of time speaking with her, finding out about her situation, and um, you know, just having spending some time with her because, uh, as she told me, she was becoming incredibly isolated. None of the carers there could speak Bengali, none of the residents there could speak Bengali. And um, her daughters, um, I think she had two daughters, both in uni age, um, they rarely came to visit and she'd been there for years. And I just can't imagine how awful it would have been to be sat there for years and barely having anyone to speak to throughout the day. So I made sure that during my time there, I would, I would uh, make sure to see that she's okay and be able to provide any help that I can you know I'll ask if she's feeling okay if she wants some food or if she wants some help from a specific carer. Okay that sounds like a good display of empathy so um, but what qualities do you have that you think could can, could impair your performance as a doctor and how would you deal with those? Um, I think something that is kind of um, something that might affect me in the future is I haven't really had to deal with any kind of significant, um, I, I guess in this uh, in the specific scenario of me being a doctor, I haven't had to deal with a patient's death. That's been my responsibility. Uh, obviously me just being an, a gap year student at the moment, but it's something that I, I look forward, uh, I, I see forward to that uh, being a potential scenario in the future. And it is something that's potentially kind of scary as obviously I haven't had to deal with something like that before, but I believe that I tend to be able to make uh, the best use of the resources I have access to. And I recognize that there are support groups that I can speak to if I have any problems with these. And obviously I can speak to my colleagues, friends and family if I'm having any particular struggles to deal with these sort of things that I'll be able to talk it out and I'll be able to deal with it better. Okay. And is that the thing you think you'd find the hardest about being a doctor or is anything else you think you'd find hard about being a doctor? Um, I'm not sure if it's what I would say I'd find the hardest. Obviously, I don't know what it's like to be a doctor. I'm not a doctor yet. So, but I do recognize there are multiple things that can be difficult about the job. Um, something that I've had a bit of experience with during some other work experience at the hospital, uh, local hospital. Um, I spent quite a lot of time at a &E, uh, shadowing some doctors there. And the pressure of the situation was uh, very obvious and very up front it was quite clear that everyone was under pressure everyone's very stressed out there's so many things going on so that is something that i i did notice quite a lot during my time there however i feel i've generally dealt with stress quite well um in my previous years such as during my uh, a levels and gccs through physical activity or yeah. my own hobbies where's the next question now thank you for the next question um it is, can a doctor or medical student be opposed to COVID vaccination? Um, I, I believe if you would like to go into work at the moment in the UK, you are required to have your COVID vaccinations. Um, and this is, this is just because for the sake of the patient, obviously, if you're uh, if you're a doctor or a medical student, you're constantly being exposed to so many different patients in a hospital where it's likely to, that you're going to be exposed to someone potentially with COVID. Um, it's important to be vaccinated so that if you do happen to uh, become exposed to it and uh, catch COVID, you're going to be less symptomatic and therefore less likely to be able to pass it on to someone else uh, later down the line. And that's important because obviously there are going to be different patients who are vaccinated and who aren't. And most importantly, it's going to be for those patients who aren't vaccinated for whatever reason they happen to have, because 
if you as a doctor are going around passing COVID to patients, obviously that's, I guess it would be going against your non-maleficence uh, pillar of autonomy because you are pretty much directly just causing harm. Um, I believe that I've, I mean, I have a close personal friend who's quite, uh, who hasn't taken their COVID vaccines. They're just quite against that general idea. They're not anti-vax. They've had vaccinations in the past, but they're specifically against COVID vaccines. Um, they have some kind of uh, predisposed disliking for Pfizer and those big pharmaceutical companies. So they've chosen not to get COVID vaccines. And I've had a bit of experience dealing with that. However, I think in this scenario, if you're a medical student or a doctor, it's pretty much that it's unexcusable not to have your vaccines um, as you're, you're always dealing with these patients and you need to be, I think, trying to practice what you preach. If you're trying to practice good health, you should be getting, your regular, uh, getting the most updated vaccines. And obviously you're going to be recommending that patients get vaccines uh, for their own health. Okay, so you've mentioned some really good points about COVID vaccines and um, why doctors should have them. Um, so another question would it is why is it compulsory for doctors to be vaccinated against hepatitis B? Um, so hepatitis B in particular isn't something I'm too familiar with, um, especially considering it's not on any kind of GCSE level spec that I've I've experienced in the past. Um, from my limited understanding, I believe it can be passed on through blood contact or some kind of bodily fluid contact. And if it if it can be transmitted through that kind of process, um, being a doctor, it would mean that because you know you might have to take blood samples or from multiple different patients during a day or throughout your life or your career, it would one mean that you're incredibly more likely to be exposed to that kind of thing compared to the average person, just because you're seeing so many different people and you're having to do these blood. Uh, take these blood samples and two it's going to also make it more likely that you're going to pass it on to someone just because when you're taking these samples then there's more likely uh, there are a higher chance of there being contact that can result in transmission thank you very much um uh another question i have for you is how freely can a doctor express their personal views um i believe that it should be they should judge the situation and do it appropriately. I think that sometimes it can be appropriate. For example, if a patient says to them, you know, I, I'm unsure what decision to make here, doc, what do you think I should do? I think in that case, it's very appropriate. You know, they're clearly asking for your opinion and they want, they want some expert opinion in this situation. And I think in that case, then it would be kind of rude not to give your opinion. Um, However, there are definitely situations where you shouldn't. Um, for example, I don't know if if there's a, a patient who's transgender, for example, um, I think it would be quite inappropriate for a doctor to just kind of out of nowhere mention, oh, I'm part of this support group that helps deal with people um, coming to terms with their birth gender. I think in that case, it would be very inappropriate and potentially even harmful uh, to the patient and especially the patient-doctor relationship because the patient will become offended and probably become offended in that scenario and uh, it would probably lead to a breakdown of trust and just cause further harm to that patient. Yeah. Um, so does a doctor have a duty to be a role model? Um, yeah, I would, I, would, I would say that doctors have a duty to be a role model. I think um, being in a position to be able to give care uh, I think it's quite a privileged position and uh, it's important that one other. So there we have it. Did you guess which university that interview belonged to? If so, pop it in the comments and I'll tell you if you're right. I hope you can see exactly what that's like now. So you can see it kind of is a bit awkward at the start. There's some brief introductions, but they just dive straight in. They'll cut you off halfway through. When you're ending with that particular breakout room and you move on to the next set of people, it just abruptly ends and they move you on. So just be prepared for exactly that sort of thing. Like I say, if you want some one-on-one -on -one help to prepare for your own interview, reach out to us by checking out the link in the description below. Otherwise, we have more videos where you can find out exactly what you need to know for uh, preparing for your interview. So check out this video here, which gives you all the resources that you need. And then I've got a YouTube interview playlist here that is going to help you prepare and expect what's going to come up. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you over in one of those videos.